Good afternoon. I'd like to call the Finance, Ways, and Means Committee to order for Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. Um, Mr. Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Representatives Campbell, Camper, Crawford, Faison, Freeman, Gantz, Here. Garrett, Gillespie, Hawk, Hicks, Lamar, Lamberth, Lynn, Miller, Ogles, Sexton, Shaw, Sparks, Todd, Whitson, Williams, Wendell, Zachary, Vice Chairman Baum, Chairman Hazelwood. Madam Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Are there any personal orders or announcements before we get underway today? Seeing none, we do have uh, three bills on our calendar today. Then we're going to hear a very brief expansion hearing from the Tennessee Housing and Development Agency, and then a budget hearing from the Department of Corrections. So we have a full calendar and a full schedule, and we will um, just move on with it. The first item on our calendar is House Bill 75 by Representative Calfee. We have a motion and a second. Representative Calfee, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, this bill goes back to 1992 when the state started getting out of the mental health business and they've sold off several facilities. And uh, the, the money goes in a trust fund for the DIDD and uh, uh, transition of other groups to back into the community. You've heard the explanation. Are there any questions? Leader Camper. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Sponsor. Um, is, is, could you explain it one more time? Is this the bill where we're using the trust fund dollars? Is that a different bill? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Use your mic. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I was in the cloakroom. But is this the bill that's dealing with the trust fund dollars for DIDDS? It is. Okay. Yes. And so I didn't hear a clear explanation. On, on that, are we taking monies, uh, are we authorizing the use of those funds to go toward capital maintenance? Is that what we're doing with it this? It is. Okay. It is. And so is there, or have we uh, been able to look at the amount of capital maintenance dollars that they're in need of? Yes, ma'am, uh, the uh, Mental Health Trust Fund is uh, just under $3 million, and the, uh, the uh, Disabilities Trust Fund is just a little over $1.3 million. Okay, so they have about $3 million, and the... Uh, the two the, together they, is uh, a little north of $5 million. Okay, and so... From the five million, they'll be able to leverage those funds to do their capital maintenance ex, uh, 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 work. And so, do you see that the amount of capital maintenance that they need would eat up the, those dollars fairly quickly? I'm trying to get a sense of if they have, let's say, they have capital maintenance um, that's you know been deferred for years, maybe. Um, three or four years of not doing anything, and so now they have a backlog of capital maintenance that may add up to maybe about, let's just say, $3 million. And so now they'll be able to take $3 millions directly out of that trust fund, apply it toward that maintenance uh, one time or continue, and they get some more. I mean, I'm just trying to see, is it going to eat away the, the uh, interest so that some of the other things that they're supposed to be doing with it they, it may limit their ability to do that. Well, it, it's one-time money. I'd hope they'd use it while, wisely, and that's not addressed in, in the bill. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor, <coughs> Madam Chair. Representative Ogles. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the sponsor. D do we know the initial um, parameters for the trust fund? The, the only thing that concerns me is we. I know we have deferred maintenance, and I think one of the other agencies said that number was right at $2.2 bill, But I'm a little concerned if we're diverting money that was intended to take care of people, and now we're taking care of buildings and doing maintenance. I'm afraid that's outside of the scope of the initial intent of that fund, and that is concerning to me. Representative Calfee. Well, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think. Let me see if I've got an answer for that. Um, 
Representative Kelsey, we, I know that we do have um, folks from F and A here that okay. could speak on this if um, if we'd like us to go out of session I and would. do that. All right. Mr. Geis, if you would um, just have a seat, and um, we are out of session. And if you would introduce yourself and answer Representative Ogle's question, if you don't mind. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Lucian Geis. I'm the general counsel for the Department of f and um, Representative, you've hit the, the nail on the head that, that when this, these trusts were put into statute, they were uh, to be spent on programmatic expenses, uh, a, a, a list of what those are. But in principle, those are recurring expenses. And what we have run into is that we have sales of property that is tied to those respective departments that are one-time costs that are deposited into the, the trust fund. And in a, from a budgeting perspective, we want to, to, do, to, to, to budget smartly by applying those one-time dollars toward one-time expenses. So it does change the statutory uh, intent from a ongoing recurring expenses to a, to a, to a one-time non-recurring expense. The, uh, Representative Camper, your, your question is, I don't have the specific dollar amount, but I can tell you that the capital maintenance needs of both DIDD and mental health exceed what is available now. So we're trying to use this trust fund, if, if new dollars come in, if, if they do sell property, that we're trying to be perspective in our budgeting perspective. So that if we do have one-time money from one-time sales, we will be able to use it for capital maintenance instead of programmatic expenses. And that, that in turn would free up the, the programmatic dollars for the department in their uh, recurring budget is our overall intent. Are there further questions? Leader Camper. Thank you. Good to see you too. I hadn't seen you in a while. Uh, so I think that answered my question. Uh, it's only when they sell property and then the profits, if you will, the net profits for that, that will come into the trust fund, they can reallocate it to capital maintenance uh, for any of their properties. Correct. Do you see where this could, um, you know, potentially set up a situation where um, we begin to reduce the amount of money within the overall budget toward capital maintenance of these pro uh, uh, for the department because we're going to rely on the monies from the trust fund. That's what's kind of troubling me. I don't want us to be thinking about, well, we don't have to appropriate as much because we're just going to take the money from there and, and, and shift it and pay. Right. Mr. Geis. Well, I, I will say under the, the current um, budget, there is not, not a lot of money, relatively speaking, in these, in these uh, trust funds. Mm -hmm. um, I think we see capital maintenance as a large need that we usually spend general fund dollars toward. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, we think it makes good budgetary sense to repurpose the, the available trust fund dollars for the capital maintenance needs of the respective department. Department. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Geis. Now back in session, are there further questions of the sponsor? If not, we've had a motion and a second. We're now voting on House Bill 75 to move on to calendar and rules. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yeah, I have it. House Bill 75 moves on to calendar. Thank rules. you, Madam Chairman and Committee. Thank you, Representative Kelsey. <clears throat> Item number two on our calendar is House Bill 84. We'll give just a second for our process. And uh, Representative Manis, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, uh, we have Committee a motion members. We have a second on the bill. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Thank you. Representative Manis, if you would explain your bill. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> this is uh, House Bill 84. It's a department bill from the Department of Revenue. And for those of you who were not in subcommittee uh, last week, 
you may not know that this is an historic piece of legislation that I'm introducing. Uh, historic only in the nature that this is my first piece of legislation to introduce. So. Uh, just a brief description. This legislation stops the statute of limitations for collection of tax liabilities during a bankruptcy, probate receivership, or an assignment for the benefit of the creditor's proceeding. During these types of proceedings, the court halts collection activities and the Department of Revenue is unable to pursue the liabilities. House Bill 84 directs that the statute of limitations for collection resumes running 30 days after the bankruptcy stay is lifted or the preceding halting uh, collection ends. So, thank you. All right, we have an explanation. Uh, Chairman Faison, I believe you had a question. I do, thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Welcome. You know, you and I both being from East Tennessee, we definitely have strong feelings about revenuers. And, um, you know, R Representative, I, are, are, do you know what the Department of Revenue is? <laughs> well, you can answer that. I I'm waiting for the manager. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I congratulate you, Representative Manis, on uh, knowing the protocol of the committee on your first bill better than the, the chairman. Mm -hmm. So uh, you are recognized. Uh, yes, sir, I do. Would you, um, would you like to care to explain kind of what they do? And I mean, are you close to the people at the Department of Revenue? Are your constituents like close to them at the Department of Revenue? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have a question on the bill. <laughs> We have an objection to the question. Representative Shaw did have what I hope is a legitimate question. <laughs> I congratulate you on recognizing that. Um, in, with all levity aside, we are now voting on House Bill 84 by Representative Manis, moving on to calendar and rules. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 84 goes to calendar and rules. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee. Item three on our calendar is House Bill 76 by Chairman Hicks. Chairman Hicks, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a motion and a second. Uh, please go forward with your bill. Madam Chair, House Bill 76 authorizes state agencies and departments to enter into agreements with third-party vendors to collect state funds on the department or agency's behalf and for the third-party vendors to deduct their service fee from the funds collected prior to depositing the collected funds to the state treasury. And with that... And, um, Mr. Chairman, I believe we do have an um, amendment on that bill that I neglected to mention. We probably need to get that on first, have it in the proper order. Okay. The dr Drafting code 003880, is that what you have? Chairman yes, Hicks? that is correct. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the amendment. Any questions on the amendment? Seeing none, voting on amendment 003880. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes, have it. 003880 is hereby attached to the bill. And now, I'm sorry, Chairman Hicks, if you could explain your bill as amended. So, Chair Lady, as, as I said just a few minutes ago, giving the summary, what the amendment actually does is just provide oversight for what I briefly described, again, just authorizing uh, the state and departments to enter to these third party, enter in with these third party vendors to basically just that collect state funds. And it allows them to uh, deduct their service fee from those collected funds prior to depositing uh, those collected funds to the state. You've heard the explanation. Are there any questions? Question has been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? House Bill 76 moves on to calendar and rules. Thank that completes the bills that we have calendared for today. Uh, we will now continue our hearings um, that were scheduled and we'll be out of session. And first, we're going to hear from the Tennessee Housing and Development Agency. They have a budget expansion request that has, um, there's a time issue associated with it. So, um, if you would, Mr. Perry, if you would uh, talk to us about the, um, the budget expansion that 
you need to um, get us to approve so you can move forward with some interesting things. Sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. When we last appeared before you, we mentioned that the budget that we adopted, that our board adopted, that preceded the arrival of uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government for the rent relief assistance program that we are launching this week. We, of course, need to account for that extra windfall for our agency, so that is the purpose of the expansion request, properly accounting for the some $383 million that have been allocated to our agency for that program. All right, um, and I know that those dollars are sorely needed by a number of Tennesseans, so uh, we were happy to um, be able to accommodate having the hearing on that today. I thank you for that explanation. Are there any questions? Mr. Perry. Chairman Williams. Thank you, uh, Mr. Perry. I'm glad to see you again. Just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to hear, uh, for those who haven't heard, that, that your department is managing these funds. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important for the public to know that <clears throat> these funds that are being distributed by your department are going directly to uh, not the people's uh, rent, but to the landlords who are accepting those rents who have had uh, an, um, really suffered during COVID. And so really appreciate your hard work there. Look forward to hearing how this process rolls mm -hmm. out, but I just wanted to make mention as to where the money's actually going. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can give you a quick update. We opened the uh, application portal yesterday morning. Uh, by close of business, we had 5,700 applicants. There's going to be a great deal of demand for this. And to follow up on that, is, mm -hmm. is, that mm -hmm. is it a first come, first serve um, program? Es essentially it is, but, you know, $383 million will last us a while. We, uh, you know, how many people we can serve, there are a lot of variables, how many applicants, how long, how much uh, in arrears they are. But we believe roughly between 25,000 and 30,000 households can immediately benefit. Uh, it's entirely likely that additional resources will be provided from the federal government as well. All right. Again, mm -hmm. I know there are many Tennesseans who are, um, you know, mm -hmm. have been living in fear that they were going to be uh, evicted, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, once this um, this abeyance was over, and so this will provide a great deal of emotional relief to those families and financial mm -hmm. relief, as Chairman Williams has mentioned, to the mm -hmm. landlords who haven't been able to collect rents and thus pay their bills, um, their taxes, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, again, uh, what I think is a good use of, of monies for Tennesseans. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a legitimate question. I, I, we just got through talking yesterday about broadband, getting it across the state, and still a lot of Tennesseans don't have it. So how is this working in those rural areas where people don't have broadband, don't have the work line of communication? Right. How are you getting that information out to them? If you could. A couple of things. There is a toll-free number call center where people can ask questions and also get some assistance in making application if they need it. We're also broadly working with other social service agencies, nonprofits, and local governments that can provide a place where applicants can go use a computer, maybe even get some help making the application and uploading the required documentation. Thank you again. Um, Seeing no other questions, Mr. Perry, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to the relief um, going the way it needs to for Tennessee taxpayers and um, both those property owners and, as I mentioned, those folks who have been very nervous about uh, maybe not having a roof over their heads very shortly. So yes, thank you. Thank you. We're going to continue now with our budget hearings. Today we have the Tennessee Department of Corrections with uh, Commissioner Parker and team. Commissioner Parker, thank you for um, being here and give us a giving us an opportunity to delve down a little bit into um, your the governor's proposed budget on behalf of your department for this year and um, with that I would just ask that um, we 
10 minutes for a presentation. It won't hurt our feelings if you're able to do it in less. And uh, then we will ask you, uh, obviously, to answer questions um, from the committee. So please proceed. So good afternoon, Madam Chair and, and committee. Thank you for having us today. Uh, let me introduce the people that are with us, with me today. Uh, Ms. Lisa Parks, who is our Acting Chief Financial Officer and our Director of Budget, uh, to my right. And uh, Mr. Brian Hughes, who is the uh, Director of Human Resources for the Department of Corrections, uh, on my left. Uh, I know most of the members of uh, this committee are aware of our our mission in the Department of Corrections, we are responsible for operating safe and secure prisons, providing effective community, uh, community supervision in order to enhance public safety. Um, let me just say that I, I'd like just to take just a second to thank the people who work for this department, uh, especially over this last year uh, with the pandemic and the, the struggles that we have faced as a department, but also the courage and, and the uh, commitment that I've seen from the staff in the Tennessee Department of Corrections in multiple facilities when most of our streets and businesses in some cases were shut down the people in this department that worked in our facilities that provided security uh, showed up every day and I'm just want to take the opportunity to publicly say thank you uh, for the job that they do to each and every one of them uh, I want to talk just real briefly about the past year in relation to COVID, you know, throughout the COVID pandemic, T TDOC has maintained a posture of flexibility uh, and adapting as needed. Approximately one year ago, uh, we began the process of going to uh, alternative workplace solutions, uh, moving most of our staff to a, a virtual environment, working from home in most cases, with the exception of our facilities. Our training academy, uh, was uh, adapted to moving to specific classes online and limiting face-to-face -face contact. We transitioned most of that training to the field in our facilities as well as uh, virtually online. As most of you know, we uh, suspended inmate visitation, volunteer services, work crews in the facilities at uh, the middle of March of, of last year. We also suspended intakes uh, from the county jails but we have resumed intakes in certain areas and uh, inter-system moves or transfers with our inmates across the state. Um, we've brought in more than 3,000 individuals uh, from the counties across the state. The backup population in our jails currently sits at about 3,500 inmates. Moving on to the budget, um, the department's FY22 recommended budget is $1.2 billion. As you can see from this slide, uh, the pie chart summarizes where uh, these uh, budget numbers uh, are dedicated uh, programmatically. 47% uh, of the budget directly tied to TDOC prison operations, 16% to private facilities, 15% to the local jail payments, uh, that's our state prosecutions account, 11% to community supervisions, uh, community supervision which includes uh, our day reporting centers, community resource centers, uh, sex offender treatment programs, uh, community supervision as a whole. Six percent uh, of these dollars go to capital uh, maintenance funding, four percent to administration, and one percent to training and enforcement. Now our next slide tracks the number of state positions we've had since FY18. Overall we've averaged uh, about 6,364 staff members in the Tennessee Department of Corrections over the past five years. Most notably, uh, we had a net in, a decrease of 112 positions between FY20 and 21. Uh, in the 2021 budget, uh, this consisted of a reduction of 78 long-term vacant positions, 25 at our vacant positions at our Carter County facility and 53 at special needs facility. We abolished four vacant medical and four food service positions and transferred that funding uh, to uh, fund some contracts that would provide those services. Our reduction plan abolished an additional 35 vacant nursing positions. Eight positions were added for the new vocational program at Northwest Correctional Complex and an account uh, and accounted at the Mark Luttrell Transition Center. The increase 
and FY 2122 is a net of 18 positions. This represents 26 re recommended positions uh, to staff two new day reporting centers, uh, community resource centers, three, posi uh, three positions for uh, legislation related to jail reimbursement restructuring, and our reduction plan to abolish 11 vacant positions at the Carter County Annex. Now, due to time constraints, we have chosen to highlight five cost increases, Madam Chair, in our budget, and but obviously we're prepared to discuss more if time allows or we'll address any specific questions related to any others that you might have. Uh, so at this time, Madam Chair, I'd ask that uh, Lisa Parks be recognized and she'll cover the uh, part of our cost increases. Good afternoon. The first cost increase is for approximately $22.2 million for our state prosecution account, which makes up about 15% of our total budget. This funding is used to reimburse the counties that house the um, state felons in the local jails and other statutory authorized felony expenses. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, projecting the population has been extremely difficult. The average paid population in local jails for the six months prior to COVID-19 was 8906. That was from September through February. This population is considered the, the benchmark to derive our fiscal year 22 population. As indicated on the slide, it is assumed the jail population was slowly build back to that pre-COVID-19 average for fiscal year 20 with a population of 89.56. Um, now Director Hughes will brief the next item. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the agency has requested approximately 9.5 million uh, for salary increases for probation parole officers and the uh, associated classifications in that series. Uh, this is to address uh, increasing difficulty in attracting and retaining probation parole officers who are commissioned law enforcement officers, and they supervise the largest population of TDOC offenders who live in the community. Uh, just prior to the pandemic, frontline PPO vacancies peaked at just over 100. Uh, that's out of 660 total positions. And turnover peaked as well in fiscal year 18-19 at 35% before falling back to 18% in the last fiscal year, but that is still above our historical average. Uh, these numbers have improved somewhat since the pandemic began, but they are still concerning. Uh, we attribute much of, the fact, much of this to the fact they're paid far less than their peers. As you can see on the chart, um, our PPOs are currently among the lowest paid in the southern United States with a starting salary of approximately $28,700. Uh, they're also the lowest paid commission law enforcement officers in Tennessee state government and the lowest paid among any large law enforcement agency in the state of Tennessee. Uh, we're very grateful that this was included in the governor's budget proposal for your reconsideration this year and believe it will help us to significantly reduce the vacancies and turnover. Madam Chair, the next highlighted uh, cost increase is for evidence-based evidence programming uh, for uh, $2,320,000. And this is for offenders that is in the community uh, on probation and parole supervision. Uh, this allows us, uh, this contract allows us to provide evidence-based programming based on the needs of the offender as determined by the risk needs assessment that's conducted uh, by the Department of Corrections across the state. The next highlighted cost increase uh, is for the implementation of electronic health records. Uh, I know we've mentioned this before in prior years, uh, $13 million that would allow us, the Department of Corrections, to procure a uh, electronic health record system to be used in all of our facilities uh, in Tennessee. The next cost increase is for uh, $2.4 million to expand our day reporting centers by two in the Department of Corrections, which adds 26 positions. Uh, as most of you know, currently we have six day reporting centers in the state. Uh, those DRCs are, are doing very well in my opinion. We see a good return on investment for those. I know we have them in uh, six locations, as I've said, across the state. And they are a true alternative to incarceration for the courts to use, uh, as well as our probation officers that may find someone that's in need of intensive outpatient drug and alcohol uh, counseling. Uh, it's, that service is provided at a much lower cost than sending somebody back uh, at 80 plus dollars uh, in our facilities. I'll let Lisa talk about our reduction plan. 
Um, the next slide is the fiscal year 22 reduction plan. It will generate a savings of $11.3 million. The first reduction will close the Carter County Annex at the Northeast Correctional Complex with a savings of 2.1 million state dollars. Closing the annex will impact the capacity of the prison system by reducing 180 minimum custody beds. We can close an older unit built in 1983 and move the inmates to vacant beds at the annex at Northeast Correctional Complex, which is approximately 20 miles down the road, and the staff will move into the vacant positions at the Northeast Complex also, so there'll be no loss of jobs. The second reduction involves administration legislation to restructure the community corrections grant programs created and remain largely unchanged since their creation in 1985. This is a cost savings of $9 million. This wraps up our reduction plan, Commissioner. Okay. Madam Chair, members, in closing, let me again say thank you for allowing us to be here uh, to present our budget. Uh, and also, uh, I want to again thank our staff uh, for the work that they do each and every day in our facilities. That concludes our uh, presentation. We'd be glad to, of course, to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Commissioner, and um, your team. I know that I speak for this group in saying that we too would like to congratulate your staff. I know it's it's been a difficult year for everyone, but um, keeping your prisoners safe and keeping those who are charged with overseeing them safe um, has been a huge challenge, and I feel that the department has risen to it, so we, we thank you for the work done in that regard. We do have a long list of questions, so uh, we'll get started with those. First on my list, Chairman Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming. I, I echo Chair Lady's comments. Appreciate you and your team service uh, and through the challenges of the last year. Thank I you. did notice uh, that over the last several years, I guess from FY15, 16 to 1920, the total dollars uh, expenditures for local jails went from 171 million down to $155 million. Uh, is this uh, this decrease over those number of years? Is this something that you're a trend that you expect to continue uh, going forward? You know, and I'll let Lisa talk more about this too. But I, I think it's, you know, that's uh, it's questionable because so much of our not only that piece of our budget but other pieces of our budget is really not controlled at the department's level. I think a lot of that would would be controlled at the local level, uh, looking at, you know, uh, the, the cases that's presented, who ends up in the, in the local uh, jails. Uh, we're working hard to get those folks in as soon as, as possible, but in many cases, uh, we find that, you know, in, in some cases, our hands are tied regarding, uh, just say, for instance, alternatives to incarceration or the use of graduated sanctions that may or may not be utilized in a particular district or an area that affects those people who end up in a jail uh, cell. And at the end of the day, the money in the state prosecution's account goes to that. So right. um, I, I think, you know, hopefully as we continue on with more criminal justice reform and the efforts that, that certainly Governor Lee and his administration are, are moving forward with, that uh, that should stay steady, hopefully, and, and hopefully, my, my hope would be to see those numbers decline. Okay. Um, I noticed, however, though, that in the governor's budget, he's included another $22 million uh, in re reimbursements to local jails. I wondered if, if the, the decrease in spending is going to continue these reimbursements uh, going forward, or would it be better to have that money housed there? I guess just wondered your thoughts. Well, my, the, the money that's being spent there for the local jails is, is, again, to raise that, and I'm assuming you're talking about the raising the reimbursement rate, $3 and $6, uh, for the evidence-based programming that will be conducted there. Am I correct? It's my understanding that there's $22 million for reimbursements uh, that the department needs for this year's budget just to stay whole. I, I Do you must. want to address that? I'm sorry. Right, um, that originated from some legislation that had been passed, and any time there is um, any kind of reduction of incarceration, then it will come out of the state prosecution's account. So 
they're looking at that as there should not be as many people going into the jails. So that's where the savings comes from is the state prosecution's account. So when that legislation passed, because it was a savings, the money came out of the state prosecution's account. Mm -hmm. So that's why, luckily, we were, you know, it was a benefit, probably the only benefit with COVID-19 that our population was down with the jails and we were able to sustain with the budget that we had. Mm -hmm. But we are anticipating that to gradually increase once the court systems get flowing like they normally were. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. My questions uh, specifically go to my district, House District 3, and the Carter County Annex. I understand that uh, the overwhelming majority of employees at that location are going to be offered the opportunity to continue their employment with the Department of Corrections by going to Northeast Correctional Complex in Johnson County. Uh, I wish we were in a situation where the annex could stay as it has been for a long time, but that's not where we are. Uh, once the Carter County Annex facility is closed, what is intended to happen with that location? And are there any people at all that are gonna be losing their jobs? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, the 180 beds there at Carter County, I'll just give you some history of, of that site. We have struggled for years to fill those beds because those beds require a, a specific custody level of an inmate that uh, in most cases uh, we find across the state minimum custody beds are very hard to fill. There's 180 of them there that's off-site separate from the main facility in which it's uh, under, which is northeast. Um, our plan is to uh, take those beds offline and by doing so, reducing our footprint there by closing that physical plant. It's my intention, and, and Brian can weigh in on this if uh, he has a different, but every employee, every state employee that works there at that facility, we have a job for at the Northeast Correctional Complex. So that is the plan. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, when you look at the cost of operating that facility, the cost is very high because of the number of vacant beds we have. Uh, we simply do not have the type of inmate, the classification of inmate that needs that type of service and that qualifies for that low level custody uh, placement at the Carter County facility. As far as future use of the facility, uh, I have not had specific conversations with the Commissioner of General Services nor others uh, at this time, but you know, this, it's, uh, it's about one acre there under the perimeter. It's, I think it's about a 25 acre uh, site. Uh, I have not had any conversations with locals uh, about potential uses for that, for that site. Thank you. And Madam Chair, uh, one follow up on this. And um, I think there are a lot of possibilities, whether it be mental health, substance abuse, mm -hmm. some other area that could benefit the people of Carter County and Northeast Tennessee. So I wanna keep that in mind. The only other comment I have with Northeast Correctional Complex being in my district is that we have two ambulances on shift in our entire county at night, mm -hmm. seven nights a week, county of about 17,000 people. That's not uncommon. Uh, what bothers me is um, when we have an incident like happened not long ago, both ambulances we're, we're going to Northeast Correctional Complex, which meant if any of the other people in the county needed an ambulance, there was not a crew on shift in an ambulance. Not your problem, but at the same time, if we could keep weapons out of uh, prisons, I don't know why that is so complicated, but I've heard stories mm -hmm. and I've asked for details and received those. It just concerns me greatly that it's 2021 and we still are seeing weapons in prisons. This has been going on for many years. Um, I just hope we can work to alleviate that. I know sometimes I've heard they use make, turn tooth, a toothbrush into a weapon and different things. People are very innovative. But I just would encourage you to try to stay on top of that because it makes the emergency services unavailable to the citizens when they're tied up at the prison. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Grimes, just a, a follow up. You had mentioned, um, Representative Campbell had mentioned 
um, regarding the closure of the Carter County Annex. Your budget document, I believe, says that there are 11 positions that would be eliminated. Um, for, are those currently filled? Or I'm assuming, since you say it's, it doesn't have a very high usage, that perhaps you don't have 11 people working there? Some of those are vacant positions? We have, we have some vacancies there, but we also have 20, currently 22 staff that would transfer over. And do you have the specific numbers uh, for that? I don't have the specific numbers, but the positions that would be abolished are vacant. Um, there's, it's not intended that anyone would lose their job. In fact, we very much want them to stay. All right. I, I just want to clarify that point. Uh, Chairman Hicks. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Commissioner, it's certainly good to see you here, and thank you for, for coming and your staff. And you certainly have a very, very difficult job. And so I, I want to commend you for the, for the work that you do. Um, one of the hot button issues right now in, in my neck of the woods, and I think slowly becoming across the state, is that of community corrections. I think I have heard from everybody in my county regarding community corrections. So what, what is the plan, I guess, for, so I think there's a $9 million reduction uh, that I'm looking at uh, through community corrections. So what's the plan? What, what are you guys going to do to th that community corrections can't do what they aren't doing now because it seems to be it seems to be really working well and for some reason it's like we're going to change and go in a different direction so thank you uh, for the question the community corrections agencies and that that program was established in in the 80s 80 I think 85 approximately and it was originally designed as an alternative back then an alternative to incarceration uh, for high-risk uh, supervision, high-risk offenders. And over the years, that program has basically been unchanged. Uh, the Department of Corrections has evolved over those years. We took on, uh, obviously, probation and parole came to the Department of Corrections. Those officers came to the Department of Corrections. And uh, there is a $9 million reversion uh, tied to that. But Chairman, we see that as an opportunity to enhance that program, uh, to go back and revamp community corrections. And, and when I'm, I realize there's, there's, there's pushback at the, from the local level. I've heard from some judges, I've heard from some DAs. But let me just say this, I, I, would, I would remind you of, a, we passed the Public Safety Act of 2016, some good legislation that uh, was carried uh, in this uh, in the House and in the Senate, and it passed. Since that legislation has passed, we've seen a, a steady decline in our recidivism rate for DOC primarily, because when you look at DOC's recidivism as compared to the jails and local, as compared to the statewide average, our recidivism numbers are down. Currently, we're about 10 percentage points lower than what you would see at the county level. Now, we still have pushback and we still have districts that do not allow us as a department to use graduated sanctions in the community in some districts. We have courts we have that, that says you're not allowed to use graduated sanctions in this area. They, those are, that's in the Public Safety Act of 2016. We have certain people that uh, re, do not uh, agree with the uh, method of supervision for people in the community, which is called risk-based supervision. Risk-based supervision follows the risk principle that says you should apply most of your resources at the highest risk offender. Those that are low risk to recidivate does not require as much supervision as that person who has more risk to recidivate, whether it be a drug and alcohol issue or a behavior management issue that's repetitive. In many cases, it's my opinion that you have areas in the state that do not want to change the way that we've done business for since 1985. I would argue that the chance to go back and revamp community corrections is a great opportunity that brings forth $9 million also that we can give back to the taxpayers. And it allows us to use Evidence-based programs ensure that evidence-based programs are used statewide, and we thought that we're following what we know are best practices uh, in the industry uh, to do that. Currently, we have 
work to do there, and I think there's money set aside to allow us to begin that process of rebuilding uh, that concept. So, so that's my explanation. I, that, and I appreciate that. I guess one thing that I that you said was to revamp community corrections, but of course this doesn't revamp community corrections. In essence, it kills community corrections. Is that well? It. I would say revamp the concept of community corrections because what we're doing in the State Department of Corrections, we have high-risk supervision, which we used to not have. We have high-risk supervision within probation and pro, and if we can take on that uh, with our current staff and take on that supervision, along with taking the monies that set aside to look at uh, four or five possible pilots that we could uh, put out and look for things like residential treatment that would go along with a particular program or drug and alcohol, uh, intensive drug and alcohol treatment that would go along with a program such as that, I think uh, we would uh, be well served. And, and I'll finish up, Madam Chair. Just So maybe some information that you can maybe provide if you can't do that today. Is we sure. begin, because I know legislation is coming to do exactly what we're talking about here, uh, which is, again, is to do something with community corrections the way we're currently doing it. So the OPIs, as far as what, what are the OPIs for all the way down for, for the current, currently held state prisoners uh, as well as um, or currently incarcerated inmates and also what's the OPIs for state probation and also what uh, the state inmate housing county jails, the OPIs for that. I think that'd be good information to, okay. to have we'll as we begin to work through. So thank you very much. Thank you for your indulgence. And to follow up on that, um, when you mentioned that TDOC's numbers are better than, than the local jail's numbers in terms of recidivism, I'm assuming those are some sort of average. Are we looking at are we throwing babies out with bathwater if we have high-performing um, areas where maybe the recidivism rate in some local uh, operations is lower than the state? I mean, when you're looking at an average, you get an average, but you know there has to be some highs and lows. So, are we giving any consideration to those uh, counties or city jails or whatever that whose numbers might be better than yours and keeping uh, those programs in place? You mentioned that you were um, there would be pilot programs, so th those would be kind of trials. If we have counties or organizations that whose numbers are better than yours already, that seems to be you know past the pilot and trial stage. So um, just help me understand if we're giving any consideration at all to locations that might be doing a, a better job than you can do. Uh, thank you for the question, Madam Chair. I the overall numbers, uh, and I can share this with anyone, the overall numbers, uh, when you look at recidivism numbers, rates uh, related to community corrections, I think the Department of Corrections, is, there, there's no question there in my, in my mind that, that uh, D DOC is, has better recidivism numbers than what you see in the community. As far as the locals and the county jails across the state, you have, you might have programs, and, and my reference was in general as a whole, uh, the average for those people who return from local jails versus those who return from TDOC custody. Uh, so yes, it, it's possible that you could have a specialized program in a particular area that's doing very well. One, one reference is uh, some of the uh, uh, grant money that we we provided some of the counties that's doing a, uh, a program at the local jail. Uh, they're, they're seeing good results there, but I would argue too that they're using evidence-based programs based on a good risk and needs assessment and targeting those criminogenic factors for the particular individual. They're not doing a one-size-fits-all approach uh, to programming people. All right, um, and the information that Chairman Hicks um, asked for, I agree that that would be very helpful. So we'll look forward to getting that from you and we'll share it with the committee. Uh, Chairman Hawk. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll echo the uh, 
the congratulations to your team, uh, Commissioner Parker, as, as well as to you for a statewide, or excuse me, nationwide appointment. So congratulations to you on that. I uh, know that's a heavy lift, but it's a great honor for you. I'm going to jump on my soapbox with the indulgence of the, of the chair lady. Um, a very short, low soapbox. It won't be very high, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. We, we're talking about closing a facility in Carter County, and I understand it's 180 bed. It's, it's an annex. We've got tremendous need in long-term mental health and substance abuse care across the state of Tennessee. And if we can reach our citizens in that way, we may not have to use incarceration as the answer to so much of what's going on. Um, and I'll look at myself in the mirror. We have Green Valley Developmental Center. As an administration, as a legislature, we need to come together and come up with a plan for some of these facilities to better address the long-term mental health and substance abuse needs that we've got. I know you've got some great programs within TDOC and you do a good job, uh, but I wanna try to help folks to stop before they get there. Mm -hmm. And I'll throw that, that's my, my soapbox for Northeast Tennessee, Madam Chair. Um, you do have a question, right? I do, yes ma'am. <laughs> uh, Hepatitis C, uh, we made a sizable investment, a, a non-recurring or one-time appropriation in the 19-20 budget of $24.7 million. We followed it up with another $10 million of non-recurring uh, request in the, uh, in the current budget document in which we are. Um, I see there's a carryover fund. Can you tell me where we are with our Hep C treatment programs? Uh, are we gonna need some more dollars? Do we have, where are we in terms of spending those dollars, Commissioner? So we have approximately uh, $18 million in balance there, uh, all total uh, for that funding. And Dr. Williams, uh, the state DOC health director has assured me that um, by the end of 21, we should have all of the people in TDOC or in our state prisons treated for hepatitis C. Now there's an ongoing process of, as we bring new people in, uh, evaluating them, treating those people that enter our front door uh, that, that may come in with hepatitis C, but also addressing those that contract hepatitis C within the facilities. Uh, make, maintaining that and staying current. We feel like that the uh, resources are there to do that and that uh, we feel confident by the end of 21 that issue will be resolved as far as making sure that everybody in our custody has been treated for hep C that has it. Representative Garrett. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, thank you all for taking the time to be here and letting us and pepper you with questions. I've only got a couple. So um, this is regarding local grants to reduce for citizen rates and across the uh, state. And, and FY 18 and 19 is $1 million is non-recurring for this purpose. And it looks like there's about $375,000 left of this funding. So my question is, is that how many counties currently are receiving these grants through these programs and I've got a couple of follow-up after after that so thank you it's three sir, three uh, including uh, the uh, uh, South Central Tennessee Workforce uh, Alliance uh, these programs uh, I think it's 250,000 uh, uh, each each year is it each year that we're providing there and the DOC is monitoring those we do provide uh, we do f provide a report uh, to the speaker and also uh, both the House and the Senate. Uh, we have seen uh, good progress there. All but one um, has really into their program and, and pushing their program forward. It's a program in Dyer County that spent some dollars on some infrastructure that is going to deal uh, basically with what uh, Representative Hawk said, dealing with mental health services and uh, rehabilitative services for drug and alcohol treatment. But uh, the return rates for those programs uh, are in about the 20 percentile, which is good for the first year return rate for people coming back uh, reoffending. So we're seeing good progress there. Uh, again, it speaks to evidence-based programs being used and, and getting a, a return on our investment. So we feel confident that that's moving forward and there's no failure there. There's no bad news there to report in that. Good, thank you. Then a follow-up is that how do you as a department measure the success of these programs and sort of what metrics do you use to define that success? Yeah, that's a great question. We have, we continuously look, you know, we, we talk about recidivism numbers all the time. Recidivism is calculated on a three-year basis. Uh, and also I would say 
people have heard me say this before, recidivism is a slippery slope because it depends on when you go to comparing recidivism numbers for one state versus another state, it really depends on how you define recidivism for your state and how it's defined and how it's calculated. Uh, but again, being able to track those participants in these programs, uh, whether it be uh, drug and alcohol programs or whether it be uh, educational, uh, professional development programs such as TCAT and all that is key. We're doing that now with our own division. Uh, we have a, a division that tracks the data, but keep in mind as we move forward with these programs, tracking that data out long term is really the key. The first, the first metric is the return rate, looking at who, who returns to custody in one year. We know that's a high number. Uh, in the past, it's been a high number. Uh, as we continue to move forward, we've got some, uh, some possibilities to work with some, uh, some vendors to provide some software that will allow us also to track those numbers long term. But really, that's the ultimate test, is how many people's returning once you re release them from the facility. Okay. I'm sure one, one final question, I'll wrap up. Uh, your current budget proposes $16.5 million for new programs that grants the local jails that implement these evidence-based programs to support re-entry. And I'm curious if this is a scaled-up version of what was happening in FY18 and 19, or is this something, is this going to be something different? Uh, this is something different. It's it's a an opportunity for sheriffs to engage in providing, uh, first of all, using the, the risk and needs assessment tool that we use in the Department of Corrections uh, to administer a validated risk and needs assessment to, that tells him the risk to recidivate for that individual. So in other words, you don't have just a matrix of programs and you assign people to a program based on where the vacancies are at. You look at the individual and see what are the specific needs of the offender that what programs they need to reduce the risk to recidivate. And it also, as you said, it requires them to provide evidence-based programming uh, to meet those needs uh, of that individual. They have to be PREA compliant uh, and be certified through uh, Tennessee Corrections Institute. Depending on what tier of certification they receive, they could receive either a three or six dollar increase in their per diem per day. I think it's a it's a great step forward. It's it's something that we know that I think will will address the higher recidivism rate we see at the local level versus at the state level. I think that it'll go a long way in uh, beginning the process of reducing that recidivism. Thank you, Minister. Appreciate you answering my questions. Madam Chair, thank you. Mr. Chairman Wendell. First, I want to note that Toy, Toy Grimes does an excellent job for your department, and he's a professional, and I'm, I appreciate him. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the staffing, specifically at uh, MCX, but I also think it's a general problem statewide. And I've heard a lot of questions during your uh, session today, and, and you've addressed a lot of issues which are s clearly important. The staffing issue at our prisons seems to be the most serious issue we have. Is, is that a fair assessment? It's one of the most serious we have, in my opinion, yes. And, and it, this is not a confrontational question. I'm not sure. trying to be ugly, but the people I work for are concerned about it. What's your solution? You know, three years ago, we uh, raised the correctional officer pay in the state of Tennessee. One of the a significant raise a significant increase in their pay. One that, when you look at the percentage-wise, I'd never seen before in my 38 years in corrections, that large. It raised the starting salary to 32.5 for the entry-level correctional officer, and after one year, it increased it to 34, I believe, thousand. That helped initially, it did. We, we saw some, in. Mr. Hughes can speak to the details better than I can, but we saw a reduction. We saw more people coming in the door to be hired. We saw people staying longer. Since that time, we've seen our turnover rate decline, but getting people to interview has just not been there. It, we haven't had the, the people to interview. I think it's, there's no one particular issue, um, Chairman. I think it's a, I think it's a mixture of 
of things, and one of them primarily has been the pandemic that we faced over the last year. We went from 500 and something vacancies, correctional officer vacancies, to 800. Today in TDOC, I have 800 correctional officer vacancies across the state. And the people who work in these facilities are working <clears throat> overtime, they're doing the best they can, and they're, they're, they're soldiers, man. They, they work every day. And um, we're um, hopeful that as we see uh, this pandemic pass and we get back to some sense of normal, that some of that will, will help, that, that that in itself will help. Uh, but it's also, it's a tough job. It's, it's a very difficult job that uh, not everybody is cut out to be. It, it has some of the biggest challenges, uh, in, in particularly in, that, in the correctional officer series. What are we going to do about it? Uh, I'm working right now internally with my team to try to find a way to try to enhance uh, people to come to work and to pay them, uh, whether that be bonuses or, or a sign-on bonus or whatever the case may be that I can fund locally or in, within the, uh, the, the department, we're looking at everything. We have a task force established to look at that very issue of retention and also hiring people. But you're right, it is a, it's a challenge. And, and again, I, I don't want to be ugly, but uh, sure. uh, there's other things we could, be, we could be doing, and I'm not here to throw you must mailings today. Sure. So. If I go to work today, Scotty just asked the question about danger inside the prisons. One of our friends got shanked five times, and you know who he is recently. Mm -hmm. um, if I go to work today in a prison in Tennessee, specifically in Morgan County, what are the odds that I get tapped to work overtime without volunteering? Let's say Jerry Sexton goes to work today. He's a correctional officer. He's got two kids who are going to play softball or baseball or basketball tonight. They've got a ball game. What are the odds that Jerry Sexton gets a tap on the shoulder? Jerry, you're working tonight. What? I would say the odds of, of that happening in a week's period is very good. Very good. 80 percent? I, I would say 60 to 80 percent, depending on the vacancies and depending on the number of volunteer. The first thing a shift commander is going to do, the first thing I used to do, you ask for volunteers, anybody wants to work tonight. But on every shift, when you have 100 vacancies, uh, at a facility, on every shift, you're going to have some overtime that's associated with covering those posts. And I'll finish up with this. And this, I don't think these conditions are your fault. I think you've done the best you can do. However, has the Lee administration considered, I mean, we put all this money on the board, and we've got money to do a lot of good things, and, and, and I'm, I think that's great. But has the Lee administration considered providing some type of retention bonus for the people who are already walking on a concrete slab for maybe 60 to 70 hours a week? I mean, is there, and I'm not, well, please, that's not an ugly question or a setup. Is there a plan to offer some bonuses or retention so we can reduce these numbers? Well, again, I think Governor Lee was, uh, that was one of the first conversations I had with the governor when we, when he took office about uh, correctional officer pay. And he was faithful in the, the promises he made uh, to follow through with that, to request it. Certainly. Uh, we've done that. And, um, uh, obviously, uh, it's, a, it's a consideration, it's, it's a concern that we have, but he has been very open uh, to me and the department to look at this issue and try to find a uh, solution to this, this issue with retention and also being able to hire people. This one final comment. In, in three decades of working for correctional officers, and I don't call the shots, I'm not the commissioner, but I would ask you to take a look at retention bonuses because the people who go to work every day uh, would be, I think the state would be well served if we looked after those people who have to go inside these prisons every day under difficult conditions. And I'm, I'm afraid it's gonna get worse if we don't do something to try to stop it. And that the COVID virus may go away, the economy may change one way or another, but I'm afraid that if we don't offer some type of bonus for the younger staff members who've been there two to four to six years, that we're going to lose those people to uh, the private sector, and it's not going to be a safe environment. And thank you for your patience, Madam Chairman. Thanks. Thank you. You do a great job. I've got no complaints, but th 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 thank this, you, this is serious. <laughs> Representative Freeman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, thank you so much. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, visiting with you uh, during a tour, and, and I 
sincerely appreciate the work yeah. you do. Um, the question was asked earlier about the community corrections, and, and I, I too received many calls from judges in my, in my area asking about it, and, and I see you, you called it restructuring, but as we've kind of gone through it, it appears that it's just going away. What would happen to those um, participants within the program um, and, and then the employees? So those, the individuals under supervision would fall under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. Uh, Ms. Lisa Helton, who is the Assistant Commissioner of Community Supervision, her probation and parole staff would take on the supervision of those individuals. They would be classified by risk and they would be supervised according to their risk level uh, as determined by the uh, validated risk and needs assessment we use today. They would be programmed accordingly just like a probationer or a prolee would within the state of Tennessee today. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, a couple other questions. You talked about um, recidivism earlier and recidivism, recidivism rates, and you, you brought up the point that the, the trick is making sure that we're comparing apples to apples. And my understanding is that in the community corrections, their recidivism rate includes arrests, not necessarily convictions, and your recidivism rate includes people who return. Uh, is that an accurate statement? And if, if so, is there, is there a way to, to square that? Uh, sir, I would, there's some, there were some things I would have to check on to answer your question, but I don't think that's accurate. Okay. Uh, in many cases, uh, recidivism numbers for state, uh, for the state of Tennessee and the Department of Corrections, we could also be affected, we could have recidivism data that shows up under recidivism for an individual who may get arrested and goes and hits a county jail, uh, depending on the nature of their charges and gets tagged as being inside that jail, would count against our recidivism numbers also. I, so I really think we're comparing apples to apples okay. here, but we'll be glad to get you those numbers and I'll be glad to share them with anybody in the committee that wants to see them as far as comparison numbers, not only for recidivism numbers, but also uh, uh, other numbers that compare to uh, uh, community corrections versus TDOC. Sure, um, and, and then you talked a little bit about the 800 vacancies. Um, when this program goes away, would, would the department be willing to hire the folks and give them years of service to, to kind of transition well, I, over? I've Is said, it? thank you, sir, for the question. I've said along, if, if these individuals qualify for the positions we have within the Department of Corrections as a probation officer, absolutely. I guess I'm, I'm not sure what's happening here, but I'll, I'll keep, I've got one more question. Um, uh, the, 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 um, um, well, anyway, I'll just close with this. I, I would really encourage you to, to listen to what the judges are saying. And they really like this program and whatever the next program looks like, if, if this one is, is done, um, really work with them because I, I think they, they, they really appreciate the opportunity to, um, I guess, work with their, their, make decisions out of their own courtroom uh, a little bit. So um, anyway, that, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Leader Gant. Thank you, Chairman. Um, going back to community corrections, uh, Chairman Hicks raised a lot of the same questions that I had as well about converting this approach and you mentioned earlier there was a total of, I think, nine million savings for doing this. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. Can you drill down into that specifically and kind of give me a better understanding of where that nine million is going to come from in the process? So let me make an attempt of that, and then I'll ask Lisa to cover any, or straighten up any messes I make. Uh, currently, there's about 14 approximately $14.5 million associated with that program. Uh, the recommendation or the, uh, the administration's bill would take uh, all but about $4.5 million of those dollars and return those dollars to uh, the state. We would take the, the balance of that and look at uh, developing some uh, systems or programs, if you will, that target those things that we know drive recidivism, such as the issue of, of housing on reentry. We know that we see there's a great need for residential 
uh, treatment after release and also uh, for those people in the community that may be on probation supervision that needs drug and alcohol uh, programs. Uh, we would also look at uh, programs that we know are currently working such as day reporting centers. We're seeing great success from our day reporting centers across the state, whether it be in East Tennessee or in West Tennessee. The return rate on those are about 21%. Uh, we've had almost 2,000, I mean 200 people graduate from those programs. So uh, it's a program that's a lot less expensive than going back to prison. So we know those programs work as well as, as some other things that, that might be an option depending on how we, uh, what type of RFP might be put, you know, put out for, for bids. And Lisa, do you, anything you want to add to that? I think that he hit everything. Um, it is grant funded, um, so we pay through that with a budget. They submit their budget to us, and we do consider it as a grant that um, we pay out. Um, they invoice us monthly um, like that. So it is based on what their budget is that they submit to us whenever it goes through the RFP process. Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, so as we adapt, from a private entity that community corrections is, is that's a private entity, considered a private entity, correct? Yes. All right, so as you pull those services away and you pull that into government, and you talked about developing a strategy and developing things as you just spoke, so what is the specific increase for the state for adapting this new uh, supervision process? Increase in funding? Yes. Is, uh, your question. We're recommending using existing resources, the, the probation and pro staff that we have currently uh, in place, along with the possibility of these additional programs that we would take the, the existing funds that's left, issue an RFP for four to five programs that would be uh, evaluated, put out and evaluated uh, separately. Uh, we will so for those uh, currently we have, is it 18, progr 18 programs across the state? We're only talking about four to five. So the rest of those uh, people under supervision would uh, go under the supervision of the staff for the Department of Corrections, our probation and parole staff. Okay, so, that, so there would be no increase in state spending by doing converting this to the no state? No additional staff as it relates to, uh, no. And that's what, there ends is where we receive the, the, the reversion or the $9 million that we can give back to the state. So no additional state dollars applied to this program? No. Okay. All right. And as these, I mean, this obviously this program is intended to help people re-enter society and so forth. So that process, can you help me understand how the state's going to do a better job of what community corrections does? Because they do a lot uh, currently. I mean, they, they, they help uh, in the job application process, helping these uh, persons, you know, re-enter society so they don't, the recidivism rate is obviously lower because of that. So help me understand, and I, I always get nervous every time we're talking about a private entity going and reverting that back to government. That, that's, that scares me. Um, so help me have a better understanding of how you think government's going to do a better job than this than a private entity. Thank you for the question. It, I would argue that you, you said that the recidivism, their recidivism rate is better than I would argue that. I would argue that that's not necessarily the case. That uh, when you look at the numbers, uh, if we're talking in in that language, if we would that we could show you where uh, overall that their uh, return rate, recidivism rates are higher on average than what state probation is. And I would say that uh, in the, in those cases. Uh, you could tie that back to the fact that uh, the supervision models that's being used and the programming uh, that in some cases is being applied. Uh, again, when you look at the research that looks at supervision of people in the community on probation and parole, 
and you, you talk about, you heard me mention earlier the risk principle. The risk principle tells you, you you put your intensive supervision on those that have the most risk to recidivate. For those that are low risk, uh, it, they require less supervision. And there's studies and there's research that shows that when you over-supervise low risk offenders, you drive recidivism rates up. I think, yeah, and again, when you look at the, the type of programs that's being provided across the state, the Department of Corrections in the state sees this as an opportunity to use this model that we're using in, in the Department of Corrections for uh, probationers and parolees across the state and not have one particular program in this area of the state and one particular program in the other area of the state. Now, I'm not talking about specifically recovery courts. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the 18 agencies that we have running community corrections doing different things, and I realize the, the courts, that's not necessarily what the courts want. They want to be able to fashion their own program and design it the way they want it designed. But I would just argue that uh, on, on average, and, and when you look at the numbers, that we can show a better return on, on our investment uh, when we do it based on what research says and based on a validated risk and needs assessment that drives the programs that people receive. Okay. Last question, Mr. Chairman. So what specifically would TDOC do differently to drive those recidivism rates even further down versus what Community Corrections is doing now? And just kind of give me an overall snapshot of what Community Corrections does versus what TDOC would do. Well, when you look at the, the individuals under a caseload, um, I, I don't know specifically the details of what each one of these Community Corrections agencies are doing or not doing, okay? I, that would take probably more time for, to explain than what I have, what we have today, but what we would do uniformly across the state is evaluate each individual under the supervision, whether it be, uh, in most cases, we're talking about probationers here. That person would be evaluated with the risk needs assessment that's used across the Department of Corrections, one, one validated risk and needs assessment that tells you what the risk is for this individual to recidivate, and it also tells you what are the elements, what are the criminogenic factors that's driving recidivism, whether this person has a drug and alcohol issue, a mental health issue, anger management issue, and then that individual would be placed in evidence-based programming as defined by the Department of Corrections to target those risk factors. They would be supervised based on their risk level. If they were a high-risk offender, they would be seen more often, much more often, than someone who is low risk to recidivate, that in some cases we know today that uh, someone may say, I want you to see this person every other week or every, every three weeks or every month in some cases. Um, we would argue as, as a department that for a low risk offender, that is not what the evidence says works to reduce recidivism for that individual. In most cases, it drives recidivism up. And that's not what I say, that's what the evidence and the research says. So the, the relationship with the local judges is not going to be an impaired in any kind of way from what you're saying? Uh, well, if you have a, if you have a local uh, jurisdiction now that's, that uh, we would always follow the orders of the court. Let me just say that. If, if I go back to my explanation about using graduated sanctions that are currently in the law in the Public Safety Act of 2016. We have districts today where the court says, you will not use graduated sanctions in my district. We follow the orders of the court. We have really have no option there. We follow the orders of the court. We would argue that uh, from a professional standpoint that we feel like graduated sanctions work and they should be used. But obviously the court would always have uh, the ability to uh, to make an order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chairman Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not going to beat that horse anymore because uh, I have some very strong feelings in there and some data and things in front of me, but uh, it, it is a very, very important issue that I'm sure when that legislation is brought forth, we will uh, beat it some more. Sure. I do want to ask you about one item that was kind of skipped over that's a, a pretty glaring item in the, uh, the list of uh, cost increases. So that's almost $18 million for constitutional carry. 
Can you explain what that is, why, it's, why that's labeled that way? Uh, I'll let my budget director handle that. Um, yeah, so the governor proposed constitutional carry bill allows abiding Tennesseans the right to carry a handgun either open or concealed while allowing Tennesseans to carry without a permit. This bill keeps the current location restrictions in place and adds several penalty enhancements for theft of a firearm. So like an example, a Class C felony at the value of the property um, obtained is a firearm worth less than $2,500. Theft of a firearm shall be punished by confinement for not less than 180 days in addition to any other penalty authorized by law. Um, there shall be no release eligibility until the okay. person served 85%. So all of those things add up. So um, this is that. really not the cost of constitutional carry. This is the cost of increased penalties that happen right. to be attached That's, to that bill. Exactly. That's okay. I, I would I'd appreciate it being relabeled uh, to be more accurate. But thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. We still have several more people on our list of uh, folks with questions. Next up is Chairman Sparks. Thank you, Commissioner Parker. Just want to also brag on Tory. I went on one of your tours, I think it was last year, Tory drove um, uh, me and Representative um, Chisholm, I believe it was, out there. John Markle was there as well and several other lawmakers. Um, you know, our country, I don't know if, I think most members know we incarcerate more more citizens than any country on the face of the earth that I know of. That hadn't changed, has it, Commissioner? No. Okay. You know, we're, we're so progressive, but then in this area, we're very um, backwards, you know. Um, I mean, I can keep you here all day long with just questions. Um, you know, one thing, uh, Jeremy just stepped, stepped out, and I always appreciate him kind of speaking up for that Centuria Brown, which surprised me back then when he spoke up for her. I think that the incarceration, just the time would be about $1.5 million to the taxpayers of her serving. Am, am I right? $1.4 million. Centuria uh, Brown, did she have like a 50-year sentence? Was uh, it 50? I don't remember uh, okay. my, uh, what um, her particular it, sentence was. Well, I do appreciate that. Chairman Faison speaking up for when most won't. But um, I was talking to one of the inmates when we'd done that tour with you, and the warden was telling me about one inmate, or I was talking to the inmate, and um, he had had 25 years, I think it was cocaine possession. I was like, 25 years? But what I'm, my, my mind's running, I'm thinking, man, what is the fiscal number on that? It's about $700,000 for that guy. Matthew Charles was in my office recently, you know, the, the First Step Act. Heck of a nice fella. We hung out and had lunch, and um, it was kind of touching when I asked him, um, you know, as a Christian believer, I said, man, how does a loving God allow you to serve 21 years in prison? He never skipped a beat. He says, I'd have been killed because I was out there running the streets, and he's a great example of, of, of the story of redemption, which costs taxpayers nothing. Um, I wanted to ask you real quick, Sheriff Paul Tom, uh, Thomas down there in Gibson County, his program. Is that something we should look at trying to replicate more of? And I know it sounds like you're alluding to some of that now, but yeah. can you expand on that program? Yeah, that's with Orchard House, uh, it, it, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a it's a program that really uh, takes people and uh, evaluates their, and I know you're tired of hearing me say this, but it evaluates the risk, their risk to recidivate, but okay. not, not what those risks are, but why they have a risk, whether it be a specific issue with, drugs and alcohol, and I think his, his program directly targets drug and alcohol. Uh, it provides intensive treatment, but he also, he also surrounds them with some, a lot of pro-social uh, support, pro-social activity, yeah. and a meaningful job. Yeah. He, he, he gives them meaningful employment and teaches them basic responsibilities and, and, and what we find sometimes that many people may be lacking. First of all, pro-social support, a, a program that will target their risk and also uh, a meaningful job. Those are the keys to success when people come back. Uh, the sheriff there is doing that. There, I know of three or four sheriffs. Uh, as I sit on TCI board and I hear sheriffs from all across the state come in, they talk about their programs and their jails being overcrowded and the things that, what can we do? Uh, back to Chairman Hawke's uh, message earlier, the, the, the point he made about uh, using interventions early on. 
whether that be drug and alcohol treatment or whether it be mental treatment um, or, or mental health for people yeah. to help make a change before they get too far down that road and they end up in our front door. That's exactly what you're seeing there at the county level uh, with these sheriffs. And they're thinking outside the box because yes, not all of those people in that program are state inmates. A lot of them are local. Uh, that's, that's, that not only saves dollars at the state level, it saves dollars at the local level, and it also makes the community healthier yes, sir. and safer. So it's a it's a win-win. You know, years ago, I, it's before you took the position, so I'm not trying to put down your department, but my former police chief passed away last year. She was a uh, first female chief in the state of Tennessee, and I had the opportunity to be able to, to speak at her funeral, but she was telling about her, one of her family members, a grandchild that was incarcerated, she said, well, Mike, they're not allowing him to get out because there's not a class. He's got to take a class and there's no instructor. And I'm thinking, there's no way this can exist in government. And it did. Sadly, it's not your fault. I don't know who to blame it on. But, I mean, I just thought, man, look at the bottleneck. What does this cost some taxpayers because you don't have an instructor? Um, real quick, if I could, Chairman. I had Trey Hargett in the community. We toured a New Vision Baptist Church, uh, and we had a, their jail ministry pastors were over. And Trey asked a good question. He says, You've helped 108 people. How come you didn't help 109? And the guy, and Bill Cope, if you know uh, mm -hmm. Superintendent Cope, Lieutenant Cope over there, he said, well, look, we're just private people. And, you know, I said, well, you don't have a lobbyist, man. That's your problem. You don't have a lobbyist. So I want to encourage these lawmakers up here to be those lobbyists. So look at your $102 billion budget and see what we can do to, to kind of change men's hearts and lives around. Get them back to work. It's, it, it kind of frustrates me when I see this kind of money that we're blowing, let's say blowing, but you know, spending. And I have faith in you. I know you're passionate about what you're doing and I could go and talk about some other things, but I'm not that you've, you've shared with me. So thank you for what you do. Chairman Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and the, the uh, chair lady left, so I get the last question, I guess. I get the second bite at the apple. Uh, Commissioner, again, we're talking about, the general from Cumberland Mount was talking about our workforce. Are we partnering? We heard from TBR earlier this session in the budget hearing. Are we partnering with TBR and their correctional facility training or, or conceptual con, uh, correctional facility training program? Are they training our workforce? Uh, TBR, we are working with TBR to establish a training curriculum uh, for statewide use uh, for, for uh, security. But I would also, let me just also piggyback on that, Chairman. We are also working with TBR with our TCAT programs across the state, putting those in, and I should have mentioned that. That's just another initiative that we've seen from the administration to really focus on job readiness for reentry. Uh, TBR is a great partner with us on that in, in putting TCATs into our facilities. Currently we have, I believe it's uh, six or nine, and they're slated for, to add another three to four inside of our facilities to, to provide certified welders certified plumbers, certified electricians that when they go home, hopefully uh, we won't see them back. But yes, excuse me and thank you for the indulgence to, answer, to add that on, but we are working with them uh, for a training program for corrections. That's helpful. Yes. And again, uh, I'm gonna jump back on the, the horse of community corrections and, and the last question I'll shut up, I promise, Chairman. Uh, as we're talking about the, the work being possibly done within the Department of Corrections, I'm worried about the, the toughest, one of the obstacles for that offender is to physically have transportation to get to and from. Are we going to be creating larger distances for them to travel to, to meet their, uh, their, their officers? Uh, tell me about that. No, sir, we would not. Uh, those officers are in, the, in those communities. We have probation officers across the state. But another thing we're doing, and it was, a lot of it was driven by COVID, and we've seen, is to and I mentioned the $2.3 million addition to the budget to add technology for evidence-based programming in the community. We're using, where it's appropriate, technology to provide uh, a program to someone electronically with a computer versus having them drive 40 miles down the road to receive a, a program in a, in a probation office. Those are some additional things that we're doing, but to answer your question, no, it absolutely would not. Commissioner Parker, I'd like to thank you and your team for being here today and for presenting parts of your budget for us and for the hard work you do and for answering all of our questions. Thank you very much for being thank you. here. 
absent objection, we're going to be back in session. And that completes our calendar for the day. Is there any other business we need to address? If not, we stand adjourned.